Welcome to the Ohio Arts Council's Rife Gallery programming series for our current show, Black Life as Subject Matter 2. This exhibition is produced and circulated by Ebonia Gallery in Dayton, Ohio. Today, we're thrilled to present artist Thomas Hudson. A brief reminder, everyone tuning in today is listening is in listen-only mode. Please feel free to utilize the chat function to ask questions, and we'll be sure to get those taken care of at the Q&A portion of the hour. Next, live captioning is available for the Artist Talk, and you can access that by clicking the closed caption icon and selecting show subtitle. Also, please keep in mind that because we're presenting from separate locations, there may be some variation of bandwidth. So if one of us freezes up or the sound fluctuates, thanks in advance for bearing with us. Lastly, to get everyone comfortable, please go ahead and click on that chat function and let us know where you're tuning in from and say hello. Okay, thank you. And now to you, Thomas. Thank you. My name is Thomas Hudson. I am an artist born and raised in Cleveland, Ohio. And I thank the Rife Art Gallery for giving me the opportunity to have this artist talk. Here I go. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, I went to Cooper School of Art and I enrolled in the production art program, which was the commercial art course of its day. Um, the big art school in Cleveland was the Cleveland Institute of Art. I was accepted in that, but couldn't afford it. So the number two art school in Cleveland was Cooper School of Art. And again, it was a production art program for one year and I got my certificate in production art. My number one favorite artist is Ken Davies. This is Ken Davies. And I got an opportunity to meet Ken Davies at the Cavalier Art Gallery in Connecticut. That was my one chance. So I drove to Connecticut to meet Ken Davies. And I got a chance to shake his hand and talk to him and I have all of his books and I learned how to paint using his methods, which I still use today. And when I talked to him, I asked him a few questions that he didn't cover in his book. And he raised an eyebrow and said, hmm, do I know you? And I said, no, you don't, but I have all of your books. And he said, let's talk. So we sat down and I got a chance to talk to him for about 20 minutes. And I told him, I felt like a very religious Catholic person sitting down talking to the Pope. So he thought that was pretty amusing, but this is my all time favorite artist, Ken Davies. And these are his books where I learned how to paint using his methods. And this is me with Ken Davies at the Cavalier Art Gallery in Connecticut. My number one favorite artist. This is um, my studio name, illustration board when I got into commercial art and illustrations. So I was working as a full-time artist. And I thought it was very cool and groovy to have a name for your studio instead of just Thomas Hudson Art or Hudson Art. So I was flipping through the back of one of my art books in the index and I saw illustration board. And I thought that was perfect because all of my illustrations were on illustration board. This is a series of work that I call Lifted. And I decided to create some historical figures using this format of the portrait, the full figure, and their brief biography at the bottom. I did all this by hand, no computer. I did all the lettering, everything by hand. And of course, this is Harriet Tubman. And this is Satchel Page. Again, this is all pencil work. And if you notice, you probably can notice that I was signing my name, just Thomas, because I thought that was cool at the time to just sign your first name. But then I discovered that there are a lot of artists with the first name Thomas, so you really couldn't distinguish one from the other. And then this is Mary McLeod Bethune, again in the Lifted series. And this is Garrett Morgan. And I was inspired by this drawing to create a sculpture of Garrett Morgan. And this is my signature. I came up with 
a series of different types of signatures, Thomas Hudson, Tom Hudson, um, just Thomas. And I finally came upon this one. And I think this works for me. This is the cover of a children's book that I did called See What I Can Do. This is done in watercolor. It was about a 15 page children's book for Golden Press. And this is the cover. Love this one. This is also the cover of a children's book for Just Us Books. And this one is called An Overnight Guest. Again, this is done in watercolor. And this is also an illustration I did. And this is a very fun one to do. And you can basically see the development of my Hudson signature at the lower left-hand corner. And this one is called I Understand. And this is the sculpture that I created based on the drawing I did of Garrett Morgan. This is in polymer clay. And here's another view of the sculpture. Now we're getting into my oil paintings of a series that I call Uniforms at Work. I was working at a job where I saw this maintenance guy, muscle guy, had the arms, and he carried his tool bag on a strap over his shoulders. And I'm looking at this guy five days a week, and I said, that guy is a walking painting. And he gave me an idea to do a series of paintings of people dressed in their uniforms. And this is an idea I had. I always wanted to do a painting of a shirt, just a pocket with a wrench poking out the pocket. And this one is called Half Inch. This is called Black Tie. And I also worked at a, um, a job. It was called the Cleveland Skating Club. And I got to know the people, the, the waiters, the, the servers, the maintenance crew, the housekeeping crew. And they got to know me and I showed them my artwork. And I said, I had this idea called Uniforms at Work to paint people dressed in their uniforms. You can usually tell what a person does by looking at the uniform they're wearing. And this is called Black Tie. His name is Jerome, and I asked him to pose for me in my Uniforms at Work series. This is Mary, and she works at Save a Lot. And I would get in her line, and I would ask her to, to, um, to pose for me because I'm an artist. And I thought she was perfect. She wore the uniforms. But she felt that she didn't look right. She felt that she was too fat. She didn't think that she was appropriate for posing for a painting. I said, no, you're perfect, just the way you are. It took me a year of asking her to pose for me. So finally, I went to the store, brought two of my paintings, and showed her my work. She said, oh, you did that? You did that? I said, yes, I did. Oh, I'll pose for you. I'll pose for you. <laughs> and I said, well, great. So what I want you to do, we can set up a time. And I wanted to have her pose inside the store. But I had to ask the manager first, and he didn't think that was appropriate. So what I did, I had her pose outside the store in front of the window. And I told her, just come as you are. Don't wear makeup, just as you are when you're working. Of course, she had the makeup and the eyeshadow and everything, so that was fine. So I had her pose outside the store. And that's what you see behind her, the window and the signs for the advertising of the produce. So I decided to call this for $2 based on the sign behind her. So her name is Mary. This is Tony Tata. I also worked at a wood shop and he worked in the paint department. He had his own spray booth. And I thought, of course, he was perfect. He had the uniform shirt on with his name and the bandana. And I call this painting Paisley based on the bandana. This is Rich. And he worked at the Cleveland Skating Club. He was one of the chefs in the kitchen. And I asked him to pose for me in front of that wall. This is Gladys. She also worked in the kitchen. She was basically a utility person. And I took several photographs of her, asked her to pose for me just as she was, just sort of interrupting her day with the gloves, the apron. And she took the time to pose for me. And this wasn't by design, but when I had started drawing the painting, I noticed that little white note poking up from her pocket. 
And so that was it. The painting spoke to me, it gave me the title, and the painting is called Small Note, based on the little small note poking up from her pocket. And of course, this is Switch. This is David. I did a drawing of him first for, as my thanks for him posing for me, and then I decided to do a painting of him. And based on the light switch in the background, I call this painting switch. I didn't want to name this series after the person's name. I wanted the painting to speak to me, to give me a title. And so when I saw this switch in the background, I said, well, I'll just call it switch. Now, this is called a mall stick. And this is sort of a, a basic hand rester. This was created in about 1611. And artists use this to rest their hands on the stick, to steady their hands, to give them a precise line, and to keep their hands from rubbing against the wet paint. And I thought that was pretty good. So I came up with the name Mall Stick Studio. And that stuck with me for about 15 years. Didn't do anything with it, but I always wanted to have my studio and business named at the mall stick studio and this is my mall stick and my easel i don't have a work with the, the the stick with the ball at the end but i custom made this mall stick right here to rest on the tray of the studio and i rest my hand on that now i decided to do a trademark search on mall stick studio it was available, so I applied for the trademark. And so now I got Mall Stick Studio trademarked as my business name, and I have my precious R for Mall Stick Studio. And that's me right there, Mall Stick Studio, the art of Thomas Hudson. Now, this is a series of paintings that I called um, Action Figure Still Life. And this was the first one in the series. And I also collect action figures. And that is the James West action figure. And I decided to do a trompe l'oeil type painting, which is French for fool the eye. And it gives you a shallow depth. And it, it looks like you can reach your hand in the back of these paintings because the depth is so shallow. And I wanted to put the figure in front of the animated James West that you see when, it, when the series comes on. And to place this figure on a rock with the poster behind him. Usually still lives are placed on a table or a shelf, but I decided to have this one on a rock, which I think is more fitting with the, the theme of the West. And this one is called West. And this is also going into the action figure drawings. And this one is called Ha Ha, and based on the, the ripped comic book cover in the back, and that's sort of like a tribute to Neil Adams, who died recently. And that's one of the covers that he did. So this is the action figure Batman in front of the ripped drawing of the Batman comic book cover. And this is pencil on gesso panel. And this is another action figure I have, Hulk. And I got the idea of sort of having placed like off center and just not really centered with the head not showing. So when you look at this, you kind of already know who that is. And again, that's pencil on gesso panel in the action figure series. Now we're getting into a series I came up with called the plumbing paintings. And I had an idea of marketing these drawings and paintings to the plumbers in the city of Cleveland. And the whole idea of selling your work is to get the audience for your work because your work is not going to be for everybody. And so I looked online to see if there were any plumbing drawings or paintings, and there wasn't. So I said, that's great. And so I came up with these series of plumbing paintings. And I had these printed up. And the idea was to approach the plumbers, go door to door, and to have the plumbers buy my work to give them away as gifts to their employees, um, birthday gifts, employee of the month, retirement gifts, and I started with the top five largest plumber in Cleveland. And they liked my work. They showed me around the offices. And one of the plumbers 
came up to meet the owner. He says, well, I don't think these guys are going to appreciate this work. And I said, okay, so I could see where this was going. They liked my work, but they weren't buying. And this was the first one in that series. This one's called At Any Hour. And this is the painting in the plumbing series. This is called um, Good Plumbing. And what I did was I ordered these plumbing tools and fixtures from eBay. I didn't want to go to a Home Depot and buy brand new fixtures. And so I went to eBay and ordered old, rusty, scratched, dented plumbing fixtures. And I got these from England. And this is the pool chain from a, a, a tank. And, and that is the toilet paper roller. And this one is called Good Plumbing. This is called pipe cutter. And again, this is still life. And the whole idea was to, I, this is a Chinese smoking pipe. And I made a huge mistake by calling this a wrench when I posted it on Facebook. And the original title was going to be pipe and wrench. So if you can get that. And a guy contacted me and says, oh no, that's, that's not a wrench. That's called a pipe cutter. So I had to change the title. So that's in the plumbing series oil on panel is called pipe cutter. This is my process. What I do, I sand and gesso a panel. I don't work on a canvas because a panel is more sturdy. And I start with an accurate line drawing. The most important part of a painting is the line drawing. It doesn't matter how well you paint. If your line drawing is not accurate, your painting is going to look lousy. So I put a lot of work in making sure that the line drawing is as accurate as it can be. This is where I do all of my erasing, making sure it's correct. I do it over and over again until it's spot on correct. So I start off with an accurate line drawing. Then I do a wash in. The wash in is the local colors of each object, the hair, the skin, the clothing, the background. And I thin the paint with liquid, it's a medium. And I quickly brush it on. And then I use a fan brush to, to even everything out to make sure it's smooth, there are no brush strokes. This is the wash-in stage. This is the wash-in stage completed. So you can see it's, it's a basic idea of what the painting is gonna look like. Very thin to allow the pencil lines to show through. Now, this is me using my mall stick. Now I'm doing what is called the blocking stage. Once the, the wash in is dry, which is usually the next day, I use the opaque paint to begin the process of one section at a time working on the painting. And this is the skin tones in the block in stage. And this is a block in stage complete. Kind of rough, uh, but you get the idea. Now this is a close up. What I do is I do what is, what is called a first pass. I do that, then I go over the portrait or the object again with the second pass of paint. There I add all the details, the wrinkles, the highlights, the individual eyebrow hairs, the eyelashes. This is where the painting begins to pop where I do all the details during the second phase of the blocking. And this is the working on the collar. So I did the wash in, did the brief block in, and now I'm doing the detailing of the block in stage. And that should just be about complete. And you notice the, I got the individual hairs of the chest and the, the coat is still in the wash in stage. And again, that's still the block in, basically completed. Now I begin the hair. Hair and lettering are my adversaries in art. I really struggle with hair. And so I come up with a method of like what I call section method, where I block in what I'm not working on and just expose the part that I wanna work on. So I'm working in one section at a time and I'm slowly moving over. And that helps me with hair. You can see the hair in the blocking stage and to the other side, you can still see that it's in the washing stage. But again, the line drawing 
is very important because that gives me the guide of how the hair should be. But I really struggle with hair. And this is Leonardo DiCaprio finished. Oil on panel. Now this is the beginning of a series of painting that I got a commission from Case Western Reserve University. And it's from the diversity department. And these are called the trailblazer portraits. This is Samuel Allen Counter. This is oil on panel. This is Dr. Deborah Hyde, again, in the trailblazer project. Oil on panel. And this is Wilma Wilkins Peebles, oil on panel. They had the unveiling for these paintings in October of 2019. Um, Samuel Allen, he passed away, so his daughter represented him. Deborah Hyde couldn't be there, so a friend represented her. And Wilma was there. And it was really great to see her. I was working on her face for about a month, the, the, the face, the skin tones the smile, the glasses, and she gave me a hug for her portrait and she really appreciated the work I did for her portrait. Now, this is the new series that I'm working on today. This is called Reminiscent Our Times Before Yesterday. And these are a series of pencil drawings where I focus on people ranging from the year 1875 to 1972. And this is the fun series that I'm working on right now. This one is called Ponsnay, which is based on the glasses that she's wearing, which are the Ponsnay style of eyeglasses. This is pencil on arches paper. This is number two in the reminiscent series. This is called Look. This one. And the reminiscent series is called mm-hmm because she has that expression where it just looks like she's saying mm-hmm and i let the again the drawing or painting speak to me and give me the title so i couldn't help it her face just said mm-hmm and that's the title of the drawing and this is luthus these um references i got from ebay and what i do is i i scour eBay to the vintage section. And I look for very interesting photographs that are in the public domain. I can do anything I want with them. And his name was Luthus Swims. Ordinarily, I wouldn't use um, the name of a person. And if I didn't see a name attached to the drawing, I kind of came up with a name myself. But I decided not to do that. Just let the drawing give me a title. But he had a name. And I thought Luthus was different. Don't know any Luthuses now, so I stuck with his name, Luthus. So this is a drawing in my reminiscent series. For the reminiscent series on my website, I am offering the drawings for sale as prints. And with those prints, if you order three or more, then you get a free mini print. And I wanted to do the celebrities of that era. And Cab Calloway is one of the free prints that will be offered for um, inclusion when someone orders three or more of my reminiscent prints. So this is Cab Calloway. This is Dorothy Dandridge, who is also being offered as a free mini print in my reminiscent series. And this is Nat King Cole, one of my favorite singers, who is also one of the three who is included as a free mini print in my reminiscent series. This is my studio setup. That is my tabaret. That is my palette table with my glass palette on top. And again, this is going back to Ken Davies, my favorite artist. This is the same setup he had. I thought his setup was ideal. It was perfect. I sort of modified it to my own taste and, and needs but I sort of modeled my work area after Ken Davies. And this is basically the way my studio looks. Same setup as Ken Davies.
And this is a link to my website, mallsticstudio.com. Visit my website, take a look at my prints, my portfolio, and if you prefer, own a Thomas Hudson print. And I thank you very much for the opportunity to have this artist talk. Thank you very much. All right, Thomas. So I think we're going to go into our question and answer portion of the hour. So if you could take us through what does a day in the studio look like with Thomas Hudson? Like to bring us from the beginning to the end of the day. Give us a, a sneak peek, kind of pull the curtain back for us. Well, when I when I am home, it's working on my new series, uh, Reminiscent, the, the pencil drawings. I work very slowly, very carefully. And it takes about a month, month and a half to finish one. And just basically getting things done. Um, I have spent most of the year working on the new drawings and getting the website updated. So my website has been completely updated, available for people to look and to purchase if they prefer. So do you listen to music? while you're in the studio? Do you? I, I listen to music. I'm old school. I listen to 70s music. I'll listen to podcasts. Um, sometimes I'll have Columbo on, you know, just sort of not really watching it, but listening to it. Um, but yeah, I listen to music and Columbo and podcasts. What's your peak time of day? Do you, are you an early riser? Do you start early and, and set up? Do you have any kind of practices within your day? Like, do you you know, light a candle or do you, how do you enter into the space? I'm asking as kind of an entry point for those listening. And also if you want to uh, tap back to, we can rest on one of your images so that folks can see that wonderful work, but uh, mm -hmm. give us, give us a greater peek into it. Well, see right now I'm working a day job, I'm moving into entrepreneurship. And so when I get home from the day job, then that's when the artwork begins. Um, and usually the weekends, which I call entrepreneur weekend, I have Friday night, all day, Saturday, all day, Sunday to do the work. And let's see. So this is where I am. And I have my drawing table there. Um, currently I'm not doing any paintings because I'm focusing on the drawings for the reminiscence series, but my day starts at usually 6.30 in the evening and working until 12 or until I fall asleep. And then it starts again the next day. Wonderful. Okay, we have a question from the audience. Um, they'd like to know about your choice to use realism, why that style or technique uh, instead of something else. And also between the portrait photograph as a start, um, then what you create in a hundred percent accuracy, where does it, where do you take artistic license? Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, the reason I prefer realism, I started out um, working with my own comic books and I was always attracted to the artists that did it real. It's, it just seemed to me that doing realism was better. I'm not an abstract artist. I don't do um, just swashing paint around. I like drawing people. And because I like drawing people, I want them to look as real as I can possibly get them. I'm really not trying to go for a photographic look, but to make the drawings and paintings look like a very good piece of artwork. And I like the flattery when someone says that something is nice and looks like a photograph. I don't know the difference between photorealism and mega realism and super realism. I don't know the difference. So what I call, what I do is just a natural realism. I try and go for natural looking flesh tones, natural looking skin tones and clothing. And that's just what I do. I, I just love realism. So um, how does failure play into your work? So for example, if you're working through a painting or drawing that just isn't like feeling right for you, um, how do you, how do you press through that? What does that look like? And, um, you know, everyone loves to ask the question of how many hours does it take? Um, particularly when these are such high touch 
works, right? Like we know that there is intense labor involved. So I think people just love to kind of uh, rest their minds into what that would look like for them. So if you could talk a little bit about that too. When it comes to failure, if it's not working, I'll start over. There's several pieces. Switch. I got to the blocking stage of switch, which is on exhibit here at the gallery. It wasn't working. So I started completely over. A new panel, started the line drawing over again, very detailed. And for me, if it's not working, no matter how far I get, usually in the blocking stage, I'll start over because I try not to, or not try, but I do not accept mediocrity. I want my paintings to look as spiffy and as spot on as I can get them. But I'll tell anybody, if it's not working, start over. If it doesn't look right, start over. Rub it out, start over. And that's what I do. All right. So something that really, so you've been in a, a two exhibitions within the year at the Ripe. You were a part of the biennial exhibition and also a part of this really excellent exhibition. And something that I think really captured the audience's um, interest and uh, the, the concept of giving so much time and attention to the common person. So our, you know, working brethren, the nine to fivers that are service industry folks um, and the importance of highlighting that particularly now when we have this kind of um, unveiling of that critical work, right? So, um, you, you have a couple of series, but I, I would love for you to talk about when you think about the intention and the time spent with uh, the uniformed um, series. Can you talk a bit more about why? Well, the time spent for me, um, you ask how long does it take to do a painting? When I first started the Uniforms at Work series, I kept a journal of my time, how many hours, the breaks. I did that for the first two paintings. And then when it came down to the second painting, I had to ask myself, why am I doing this? I mean, what does it matter if I spend 300 hours on one painting or 150 hours on another painting? Doesn't matter. Each one has its own lifespan. Each one takes the time it takes to finish. So people ask me, well, how long did it take you to do that? My answer is, I don't know, I don't keep track. But the uniforms of work paintings, I spend months on one. Switch here at the gallery, I spend seven months on that one. I do remember that, but however long it takes to finish because each one has its own lifespan. And I just work the time it takes to finish. And when I'm satisfied it's done, it's done. Um, I love that as an answer. I oftentimes when folks ask artists how long it takes, I, I uh, like to tongue in cheek insert uh, a lifetime because it's yeah. not only the time taken to make the piece, but also the history of that, like you're learning. And so in that same kind of breadth, I'd love for you to talk about when, have you always been interested in painting and drawing? Um, when did you know that this was a path for you? Like, how did you identify this? Now you showed us really beautiful, gorgeous work, but you know, there's a learning curve ahead of that. So I'm curious, you know, like how, how young did this start? Where did you feel rested into your talent in a really significant way? I always loved comic books. When I was a child, I collected comic books. I gravitated towards the artist that drew realistically, Jim Apero, and again, the top guy, Neil Adams, who died recently. I always loved realism and drawing the figure and wanted to be a, a comic book artist. And I started drawing my own comic books, creating my own characters. And my father saw what I was doing, and I was about 14 years old. And he says, you know, you're very good at what you do, but you're kind of focusing on comic books. Uh, learn how to do it all. Look at what other artists are doing. Look at what painters are doing. The comic books are fine, but there's a whole world of art 
out there. Just look at and see what other artists are doing. So I did that. And that's when I got into Norman Rockwell, Salvador Dali, James Bama, Maxfield Parrish at 16 and 17 years old. And I discovered these wonderful artists who painted realistically. And I said, that's great. And especially Norman Rockwell. And I'm studying Norman Rockwell. He has 12 steps from start to finish. And I said, that's a lot. And so he even called his paintings that they could explode. He has so many steps that he, he does from start to finish. But I always love the artists that paint it real. And going from comic book drawing to Salvador Dali, James Bama, Norman Rockwell, and then my all time favorite, Ken Davies, whose books that I showed you earlier. I like Ken Davies because he shows you how he did what he did, step by step. And what I showed here, I start with the line drawing, the wash in, the block in, the detailing, the glazing, the scumbling. Those are Ken Davies' steps. You can take 10 artists. And each one will have their own particular methods of getting from point A to point Z. But Ken Davies' methods stuck with me because he showed me how. And I thought it was a basically simple way to do it. And that's where I am now. So we have uh, two additional questions. I'll, I'll continue going in order. Um, in the painting titled Switch, which is in this current exhibition, um, the question says, I felt like a lot of, could feel a lot of undertones of royalty, especially in the use of purple and the adornment of the subject's hands, which leads her to ask, why is it important to be a part of black life as subject matter too? And do you feel like this work uplifts and celebrates BIPOC folks? Well, I do with the, um, the switch. Um, he's an African American, but with this theme, I kind of wanted to get all kinds of people, um, black, white, Asian, Latino, and I felt that, of course, this one fit the theme of the, of the gallery exhibition, and he just worked, and I felt he was appropriate, and there it is. Wonderful. So um, we have another comment and then question um, that says, mad respect to your work, really excited to learn of such a wonderful local artist. So they must be in Cleveland. Um, how do you choose your models and how do you build the connection with them? Well, that's interesting. Uh, most of the people, well, all of them are people that I know. And so it was easy for them to pose for me because they saw my work and they knew me. But with the Uniforms at Work series, the major problem I had is getting people to pose for me who don't know me. I would observe this crossing guard. I wanna do a crossing guard in the series. And I was observing this crossing guard when I would drive around the area. And one day I had time to park and I had my business card. I approached the crossing guard I told her who I was, I'm an artist, and I have this series called Uniforms at Work, and would you mind posing for me? And she looked at me like I was crazy. She didn't know who I was, didn't know what the photographs were gonna be for. And I said, well, just look at my website and you can see what I do and maybe I can get back to you. But she had this look on me like, you know, who is this guy? What does he want? That's the, the challenge is getting people to pose for you who don't know you. I saw a guy outside a, a grocery store. He was on break. He had the, um, I guess, the white apron. He was smoking. He had the dirt, the stains, the wrinkles. It was perfect. And I gave him my card, and I asked him, would you pose for me? I'm an artist, and I think you're perfect to pose for my Uniforms at Work series. He looked at my car, looked at me, and he said, no, oh, no, no thanks. And see, that's the challenge of getting people who don't know you to pose for you. But with this series, everybody who's a subject of a painting, 
is someone that I knew. And what I do is I start with taking photographs of them. I start with the four figure long shot, then I get close to the face, the eyes, the eyelashes, the eyebrow hairs, the various elements in the pockets and whatever. And I take all kinds of pictures to give me as much information as I can. And then I work from the photographs and there you go. All right. Um, so another question, how does confidence or, and or trust in the process and vision play a role in your work? Has it grown as you've gained more experience? Well, yeah, the confidence is because I have my technique basically down to a science, line drawing, washing, blocking, glazing, scumbling, all the detailing. I do the same thing every time. And again, if it's not working, I'll start over. And it's 10% how you draw, and it's 90% what you draw. And the reference is very important. I never show my reference because the artist still wants to be the magician. You don't want to show your reference and the, um, the painting next to it because people will go back and forth, photo reference, photo reference. So I always want to be the magician and just focus on the drawing only. I'll change some things. Uh, it may not be the same color. And sometimes depending on the reference, if the eyes are not correct, I'll get another source of reference for the eyes and I'll completely change the eyes. So everything looks kind of perfect. And I go from there. So I make sure that what I'm doing is completely accurate. The line drawing is very important. And that's where the confidence comes in is the line drawing. If my line drawing is great, then I can start. But once I get into the block in and if it's not working, I'll start over. I have a confidence in, in knowing that if it's not working, I'll start over. I don't, I don't try and, and, and work with it. And, and if it's not working, I'll just stop and start over. And I have that kind of confidence knowing that I'll get it right eventually. So how do you know when a piece is complete? <laughs> well, when it looks good and I say, well, I can't do any more with it, it's, it's fine and I put my signature on it and it's fine. And when I get to the point where I step back and I contemplate and I look around and I say, well, I can't do anything more with it. It's done, then I'll sign it. That's when I know. So um, tell me a little bit about uh, what it means to be an artist to you. Like, what is it within your life? Um, what does it mean? within your community, how, what is the importance of you being an artist and being within the artistic space? I like looking at the works of very good artists to be inspired by what they do. I have a list of favorites that I continue to go back and forth. And starting as a child, drawing and doing it over and over again until I felt that it was right. And I just like the idea of knowing that I have this talent and this skill that I'm continuing to work on, um, knowing that this is what I like to do. I like drawing and painting. I like creating a piece of work and showing it off and letting people see what I can do. And I like hearing the flattery I like people knowing to tell me what they like the work and it's very inspiring. And I don't feel that I'm competing with anybody. The main competition I have is myself. And I look at Switch here and I say, well, that guy is pretty good. I, I need to keep up with Thomas Hudson to make sure that I maintain the same level of quality as the previous paintings. And so I look at my previous works and I say, I got to match that and, or do better than that. And I just love drawing and painting. I love looking at the works of other good artists. So if you don't get into the studio one week, is that a, is that a tough week for you? 
it's a tough week when I fall asleep on my work, <laughs> knowing that I have the time and I fall asleep and I felt that I missed time um, and I'm disappointed. And it's just tough, you know, just working a, a day job and then coming home and doing the artwork and then falling asleep in the chair and not getting anything done. And so that's the tough part. That's the challenging part. So I'm working towards that transition from the day job to entrepreneurship and doing everything full time. Wonderful. So um, we have a, another question. Do you have a favorite piece, one that's impacted you greatly in your career? And I'm going to do that twofold. I'm going to ask you for a favorite piece of your own. Uh -huh. And then I'm going to ask you for a favorite piece from another artist. Okay. I'll, okay. This is my favorite piece. Small note, this one is not for sale. Um, my only regret with this one is that I didn't paint it bigger. Uh, but I just love the way I painted the denim, the, the plastic gloves, the bleach stains on the shirt, the lobsters in her hat, the skin tones. This is my number one favorite piece. And this is the one that I compete with with every other painting that I do. This is it. All right. So is there a incredibly impactful piece of artwork outside of your own that speaks to you um, it, and then impacts you? Well, there isn't any one particular piece. It's the, um, the collected works of Ken Davies, my favorite artist. Um, I have three of his books and I just flipped through his books and I'm inspired. I don't have one particular piece that's a favorite uh, of any other artist that I like, but just the, the oeuvre, the entire works of Ken Davies. Um, he's the guy for me, but I, I just love his work and he's my inspiration. Wonderful. So um, Miriam would like to know, where do you announce your upcoming events and do you do studio visits or teach? I don't have studio visits. I do plan on having my own workshops. Um, so far, there is nothing uh, as far as an exhibition coming up. I've already been in four exhibition spaces since last October. And so far, nothing on the horizon so far. All right. So as a, a way to close us out for today, I would like for you, um, to share with us something that you think would have been helpful for you as you started into, uh, in earnest, your artistic work. So the, those that are on the path as artists, those that are arts appreciators, um, and those that may be um, pointing their sights towards the arts, what piece of sage advice would you give folks um, that can span across all of those audiences? My advice would be to come up with a theme, a niche for yourself. In my earlier years, I was kind of doing a hodgepodge of different works, not really focusing on the theme. The works were good, but when you come up with a theme, something you can call your own, that niche that is yours. And I have never suffered from artist block I always have something to do. I got basically three themes going on and I got enough work and ideas to last me for a lifetime. But I would recommend coming up with a theme, something you can call your own, um, whether it be in oils or acrylics, pencil, ink, whatever it is, but focus on something you can call your own that has a collection or a specific direction that you want your work to go into. And I guarantee you, you will never have artist block. That is wonderful sage advice. Um, thank you so much, Thomas. Uh, this has been really, really lovely. Um, thank you all for joining us for this artist talk by Thomas Hudson as a part of our programming for Black Life as Subject Matter. I'd love to give a special thank you and a shout out to curator Willis Bing Davis for putting together such a great exhibition. 
um, also to the additional participating artists, as well as to the Ohio Arts Council's board, the Ohio legislature, the governor who supports the Ohio Arts Council and this great space. And of course, Ohio artists. Thanks everyone and have a great day.